Okay, we'll, we'll get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the final fall lecture of the CAP Guest Lecture Series. Um, my name is Andrea Swartz. I'm the Associate Dean, and Alexandra Lang will be our speaker. I'm going to introduce Michael Burayidi, who will introduce her more fully, but I just wanted to give a thank you to some of the people that work behind the scenes to make the lecture series work so well. And that's Christine Ryan, who I don't see right now, but you, yeah, there she is. I would say round of applause for Christine. Um, and also Malcolm Cairns, who will kill me later for mentioning his name, but thank you both. I also, last thank you is to University Media Services. These people are wizards, and they are, thank you for all that you do to make it a success. Um, so now, yeah, I'll introduce Dr. Michael Burayidi. Uh, please fill out the little slips if you want to be pulled for a possible book. Um, please fill out the slips as the bucket goes around if you're a student. But thank you again, and here's Michael. Did everyone do this? Everyone, yes? Anyone want it to put there? It's not a lot of names in there. Only criteria is studenthood. Here is Michael. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer today. The future of the American shopping mall is at the forefront of planning in cities across the country and especially in the Midwest. Today's guest uh, lecturer wrote what I will deem the Bible on the topic of how the mall became what we know it to be today. Alexandra Lang is a design critic whose work has appeared in many publications, including Architect, Curbed, Metropolis, The Atlantic, New York Magazine, The New Yorker, and The New York Times, among many others. She is a columnist for Bloomberg City Lab and her latest book, Meet Me by the Fountain. An Inside History of the Mall was published by Bloomsbury, USA this past summer. Please join me in welcoming Alexandra Lang to CAP and to Ball States. Hello. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And thanks so much for this invitation. Um, this is my first trip to Muncie, though not my first trip to Indiana. And I have already been able to visit your beautiful Muncie Mall um, to add to my like lifetime list of malls. Um, so that was fun to do. And um, I'm going to I tried to put a number of Indiana examples in my talk today, which I realize is a little bit risky because all of you know much more about Indiana than I do. But I was hoping by doing that to show you how the history of the places that you already know about is part of this whole longer arc of mall history. And in a way, malls everywhere come from the same sources, and so their histories their ups and their downs are really like all part of the same story. Um, and that's definitely the story that I'm telling in my book. And I'm hoping that people will read my book and kind of take that knowledge back to wherever they are and hopefully learn how to think more creatively about their malls. Um, so the first mall I'm going to talk about today um, is a mall that many of you are probably too young to remember. Um, the original commons in Columbus, Indiana, uh, designed by Caesar Pelly and demolished in 2008. 
So in the 1976 progressive architecture story, Piazza, American Style, the critic John Morris Dixon set a melancholy scene for downtown Columbus. From its seedy downtown to its highway commercial strips, Columbus looked all too much like any Midwestern town of about 30,000. But Columbus, Indiana, as I'm sure some of you know, was and is not just any Midwestern town. Starting in 1954, the Cummins Foundation, underwritten by the town's largest employer and visionary chairman and CEO, J. Irwin Miller, offered to pay the architectural fees for new public buildings if their designers were chosen from a list of distinguished national practices. The results were a post-war building boom in superlative modern architecture, from schools to fire stations to the post office and the city hall. Aero Saarinen, a close friend of Miller's, designed two churches, a bank, and two houses for the Miller family, and advised on the initial list of architects for public commissions. When it seemed like Washington Street, which was the town's main retail strip, was in danger of turning into a seedy downtown due to the competition from the newly built suburban malls, Miller's Irwin Management Company stepped in with an architectural solution. Victor Gruen, the Austrian-born father of the American Mall, had always argued that the enclosed shopping center could replace Main Street in the American suburbs, and his earliest designs had often included public facilities and public programming. But by the early 1970s, that utopian vision had soured, and most shopping malls were being built as explicitly and exclusively commercial enterprises. But Irwin called up Gruen's firm, which asked project architect Caesar Pelli to create a commercial building that would match the adventurous design spirit of those previous works by Saarinen, Harry Weiss, IM Pei, SOM, and many more. Pelli, who had worked for Saarinen for almost 10 years before moving to Los Angeles, already knew Miller and the town, but he also brought his California commercial experience and his developing preference for building envelops, buildings enveloped in shiny colored glass skins, like the two you can see here. The building he designed for Washington Street was a hybrid in multiple ways. The courthouse center and the commons, which was completed in 1974, connected a privately owned shopping center, which included a Sears, a two-screen cinema, and a strip of smaller boutiques, to a city-owned and Irwin family-funded two-acre public space with a free indoor playground. It had open seating, a performance stage, and even an art exhibition gallery. And the whole thing was wrapped in this whiskey-colored glass, which rose to several peaks, like a chip off the block of his more famous blue glass Pacific Design Center. This is not a mall, Pelly told interviewer Michael Crosby. It is more like a downtown living room. When Erwin Miller asked me what could happen in this space, I told him that I wanted it to function for late 20th century America like a piazza functioned in 17th century Italy. Mostly, it would be a great place where people would come, read the paper, have a cup of coffee, meet with friends. But occasionally, something will happen there that will bring in people from the whole town. Pelly's ambitions for the space matched that of the Irwin family. And he would leave Gruen's office soon after the end of this project and go on to create other versions of the glass enclosed living room. First at the Museum of Modern Art and subsequently at the World Financial Center in Lower Manhattan. He also designed the Rainbow Center Mall, which you can see here, which opened in 1977 and had the same ambitions to bring indoor public space to the failing downtown of Niagara Falls. But in this Columbus Mall, rather than enclosing a central atrium in layers of shops, like a traditional suburban mall, Pelly put the two-acre public space out front on Washington Street and used the movement of children and especially commissioned kinetic sculpture called Chaos One by Jean Tingli to draw people in. On the project's most traffic corner, he created a 15-foot air wide air door that was intended to stay open all the time so that residents could flow seamlessly from the exterior to the interior sidewalk. 
Um, my favorite part of this project has always been this verbal plan that was made by the Gruen office, which graphically shows the architects and clients' dreams for what might happen at this mall. There are you know, the half round bound cats by the front door that read sit, talk, sit, talk. Um, the playground area, which you saw on the previous side, um, is filled with action verbs like explore, crawl, climb, and run. While Chaos One is a nexus for activities for both the very old and the very young, toy, talk, clock, look. And stretching off to the west, down the spine of the commercial part of the columns, it reads, mall, 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 shop, shops, shops. That part didn't really require an explanation, whereas the more radical plans for the public space areas did. So this version of the commons was really ahead of its time and like a number of equally ahead of their time examples, no longer exists in this form. The public part of the commons never became self-sustaining as a community center, and the commercial space faced uphill competition from larger, cheaper, and easier shopping experiences in the suburbs. Um, so the new commons, which was built on the same site as the old, has an actual outdoor plaza, it has transparent glass walls, and it has a more obvious delineation between community space and private retail. One thing it does maintain alongside the Tangley sculpture is a free indoor play structure. And I was recently at the um, Century City Mall in Los Angeles, and I noticed that they had a climbing structure from the same manufacturer. So I think even now, this idea of free indoor play as being part of the mall like, can be traced back in some ways to the commons. So I have several reasons for starting my talk today with the commons. One, it's in Indiana, which thanks to the Simon brothers, continues to play a major role in mall history. And two, I think its design and its verbal plan make explicit the many, many community functions that less dramatically designed malls perform every day. I mean, just when we were at the Muncie Mall earlier, um, Scott called my attention to all of the mall walkers there. And mall walkers are really a national phenomenon to the extent that the CDC has a mall walkers handbook um, as part of its public health initiatives because they consider that a really important physical and social outlet for older people. Um, in Columbus, the Irwin Management Company was willing to play a premium for the public space to be actually public, but privately owned malls also provide climate controlled space for people to people watch, for children to play, for older adults to walk, and for people to meet up at fancifully designed clocks or cool off by the fountains. So as we start to consider malls post-pandemic or almost post-pandemic, um, I think the best way to think about their future is to remember how they were and are resources for community beyond consumerism. Adaptive reuse of industrial buildings fueled a new kind of mall dubbed the Festival Marketplace in the 1970s. And many of the best ideas for repurposing malls similarly treat them as a land bank of sorts of enclosed, climate-controlled, already constructed space in a generally built-up environment. They use people's positive associations with malls to, bring, to build new memories while potentially altering the zoning ownership structure and target audience of the mall to meet the reality of today's suburbs. So where once the organization of malls came from the top and from anchor tenants like department stores, many of today's successful shopping environments have been tweaked from the ground up, changing with an area's demographics to reflect the growing desire for pedestrian life, um, for global food preferences, for entertainment needs outside the home, and to their connections to other places in the world. And the origins of the mall are in fact very international. Um, I mentioned Victor Gruen before, but in 1948, um, Victor Gruen, who was a Viennese architect who emigrated to the US to escape the Nazis in 1938, had a successful practice designing department stores for a number of smaller chains like Grayson's. Um, on a flight back from a meeting in Los Angeles with Grayson's, the weather got rough um, the East Coast was blanketed in fog, and Gruen's plane had to make an emergency landing in Detroit. 
Gruen was not one for downtime. He was actually uh, a frequent flyer before that category even existed. Uh, but he'd never been to Detroit before, but he'd heard of J.L. Hudson's, which was then the second largest department store in the world. And he decided to stroll over to look at it from his hotel. Um, in his memoir, Gruen writes about the experience, before bedtime, I decided to wander through the very center of the metropolis. The walk did not take much time. Everything seemed outdated and run down and lifeless. There was only one dramatic exception, amid the stagnant desolation. I feel like he's laying it on a little thick here. Um, the 10-story block-long J.L. Hudson department store with its seemingly endless, brightly lit windows was like a bulwark. So the next day, Gruen took an eight-hour driving tour of the city, guided by the father of a colleague. And that man told him that real life happened exclusively in the suburban areas. But these two left Gruen cold. Um, he wrote later that the main roads circulating between the suburbs were also a patchwork, a garishly advertised parade of filling stations, hot dog stands, department stores, snack bars, liquor stores, supermarkets, chain stores, used car lots, and funeral parlors, which is really a suburban road landscape that we're all still familiar with. Um, and he was most annoyed by the fact that each of these different uses was in its own one-story structure with its own parking lot. So even to go from one store to the next one, you had to pull out of the parking lot onto the road, pull into a new parking lot. And he just felt like not only was it ugly, but it was like a physical drag. So when he finally got back to New York, he wrote a letter to James Weber, um, the nephew of the president of J.L. Hudson, and he argued that despite the grandeur and good taste of the downtown store, they had to build a store outside the city limits. That's where the population was going. But James Weber explained that his uncle felt Hudson's size was part of its competitive advantage. Extracted from its historic place at the center of the city, would the brand hold its mystique? So the solution that Gruen came up with was to remake the circumstances of the downtown store somewhere other than downtown. Hudson's should once again be a pioneer. It should reshape the sprawl that was happening outside Detroit into a setting worthy of the brand um, and build a shopping center with the new department store as anchor that would be a cultural, social, and service center for the more than 500,000 people who lived in its vicinity. The Hudson's executives were intrigued, and within the month, Gruen and his associates presented Hudson's leadership with this master decentralization plan, which showed four regional shopping centers located at the edge of Detroit's current suburban development, Northland, Eastland, Westland, and Southland, which basically set up the mall naming tradition that we all still experience today in many places. I also think it was really bold of Gruen to kind of go in and say, oh, you need one shopping center, and then present them with this plan that meant they were going to have to buy, build four shopping centers. So Northland, um, the first on the list, opened in March 1954 to an average of 40,000 to 50,000 visitors per day. The layout of Northland was very simple. A large square Hudson's department store sat at the center dressed in simple brick with a vertical grid of white concrete columns. And at the ground level, the edge of the building sat back, creating a 14-foot deep covered passage around the edge of the whole complex. Five additional buildings with smaller stores flanked the sides and back of the anchor store in what he called a cluster scheme. Between each of the buildings, there were landscape plazas with fountains, flowers, sculpture, and trees offering seating and shade. Gruen referred to these spaces between the buildings as the shopping center's most important town planning element and named them accordingly after the courts, terraces, malls, and lanes that made up the European cities that he was familiar with. The landscape architect Edward Eichstack supervised the arrangement and plantings of the courtyards, and Lily Swan Saarinen, who was then the wife of Aero Saarinen, coordinated the outdoor sculpture contributing a work of her own, a wall-sized ceramic map of the Great Lakes. A 22-foot 
tall totem pole created by the artist Gwen Lux became the center's uh, nominal meeting spot. So Northland uh, was a huge hit. Soon after, Gruen was contacted by the Dayton family of Minneapolis, another downtown department store family. Um, and by the early 1950s, they had also begun to see a downturn in business. Like the Webbers in Detroit, they realized they were going to have to open stores in the suburbs, but they wanted to exert control over their surroundings and, as an additional bonus, the weather. That's where Gruen came in, offering his same advanced modern design with a European sensibility, um, and a des de design for a shopping mall that was centered on a plaza meant to remind shoppers of the town square or a bustling plaza in Vienna. Um, you can see that design here. The black skylight indicates that central top lit plaza, which was surrounded by two department stores and two bands of individual shops. Um, this mall, however, was an improvement on the shopping center idea of Northland um, because Southdale in Edina was, became the country's first indoor shopping mall. The, all of the advertisements leading up to its opening um, boasted that it would offer 365 shopping days a year in a climate uh, in a state known for high humidity in the summer and lots of snow in the winter. Uh, Gruen's plan for the Dayton-owned land around this mall um, originally included high-rise housing, a medical center, a school, and offices, but the Dayton family ultimately sold off that land to single-family home developers, and subsequent mall developers followed suit, um, which meant that Gruen's idea that malls could be kind of a densification apparatus and a new center never really panned out. The central open space uh, at Southdale was called the Garden of Perpetual Spring, underlining that balmy weather always indoors. Um, and it featured plants and fountains, a carousel, an aviary, and two sculptures by Harry Bertoya that are still in place today, known as the Golden Trees. Southdale was also a huge hit, and national press covered the opening as a major suburban breakthrough. Gruen Associates soon had more work than they could handle, but over time the design of the mall would mature and the cluster plan that you saw at uh, Northland and then at Southdale would be discarded. The simplest version of the other early malls was shaped like a capital I, with one department store at either end and shops lining the sides and typically planters and benches down the middle. From 1961 to the end of 1970, 240 regional malls um, were built in the United States, and the majority by specialized developers, including Edward DiBartolio Sr., who was based out of Ohio, Rouse Company, based um, out of Maryland, Alfred Taubman, and Indiana's own Simon Brothers, Melvin, Herbert, and Fred. The story of the Simon Property Group based in Indianapolis, and today one of the largest real estate investment trusts in the world, closely follows the tra trajectory of American mall building. Um, the early Simon Brothers projects were small open air plazas op anchored by a supermarket or drugstore. And their first wholly owned property was a strip mall in Bloomington, which opened in August 1960. The good relationships that they developed with um, anchor stores like Sears and Woolworths at those plazas allowed them to borrow enough money to build and operate the enclosed malls that they saw Gruen making succeed. Their first indoor property, University Plaza in Fort Collins, Colorado, opened in 1964 and was built around an existing Montgomery Ward store. And they opened two more in Indiana that same year including Mounds Mall, um, whose you know, logo you can see here, and College Mall near Indiana University with Sears and H.P. Wasson, which was once Indianapolis's signature downtown department store, as the anchors. So just as Gruen had worked with Hudson's at Northland and then it, with Dayton's at Southdale, the Simon brothers catered to these downtown merchants who were worried about their fleeing customer base. Um, as their business grew and grew, they would continue to keep up with the trends in mall making, building hundreds of suburban shopping centers of increasing size, 
while also investing in some super regional centers like the Mall of America, which I'll get to slightly later. So these were all, these early Simon malls were all pretty simple utilitarian versions of the mall. And, but through the 1960s, the country's best architects began to experiment with the mall as an architectural type. Their most ambitious model from the past was the arcades and gallerias that sprang up in the mid 19th century in both Europe and the United States, um, thanks to advances in cast iron and glass technologies. The granddaddy of all of these gallerias, which I hope you've seen in some architecture history class, is the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan, which gave its name and its form to dozens of malls with long barrel belted glass roofs. The first to take on this look was the Houston Galleria, which was developed by visionary developer Gerald Hines and designed by Gyo Obata of HOK. Hines saw Post Oak, the area of Houston where the Galleria was built, as the node of a new urban center. And the Galleria, which also pioneered the mall ice skating rink, um, you see Edina got perpetual spring and Houston got perpetual winter. Um, was anchored by two department stores, including this Neiman Marcus, whose design um, was inspired by Le Corbusier's La Tourette. It also anchored a much larger mixed-use development, including hotels, housing, offices, and a sports club that had a track on the roof going all the way around the skylight. Um, and these were all ideas that Gruen had originally had for the area around Southdale, but hadn't had the money and developer support to uh, continue with. So when dis discussing the history of architecture and design, we tend to focus on the designer as the author of the work, but I think it's a little bit different when it comes to malls. Gerald Hines began as an office tower developer, but in projects like the first two gallerias in Houston and Dallas, he really expanded his scope to city making, putting malls at the center of new mixed use neighborhoods. Um, I'm showing you one of his tools of persuasion here, a brochure that he showed around to other potential investors before the design for the Galleria was finished. Um, and what kind of interests me about this brochure is that it uses post oak as if it were already a place. Um, and the brochure presents the Galleria as a kind of theme park of urban life, where everything is taken care of and everything is fun. It's like a mall utopia with ice skaters and a carousel and circus banners. So Galleria's created a bridge between the past and the present, the old world and the new. And as more Galleria-shaped shopping malls were built, many went back into existing cities like their 19th century models. The Galleria Forum becomes the look of choice for developers and architects who are trying to make downtown shopping competitive again, even in a place like Manhattan, where Cesar Pelli went and put this Galleria um, right, you know, right downtown um, in Battery Park City. But in the 1970s, the mall, which was supposed to replace the city in the suburbs, went back in to save the city. Um, and the Galleria wasn't the only way that cities strove to make downtowns competitive. On August 26, 1976, Mayor Kevin White stood between two of the fat columns in front of Quincy Market in Boston, a Greek Revival stone building built to house the overflow of merchants from nearby Faneuil Hall. Boston branding was out in full force that day. A brass band played the Star Spangled Banner, a man in a tricorner hat rang a cowbell, and White unveiled a statue of his predecessor, Mayor Josiah Quincy. On the porch with him were developer James Rouse and the designers Benjamin and Jane Thompson. Um, they followed a kilt-clad Scottish bagpiper um, inside to ship, ship champagne under the building's glorious dome. So Boston was the birthplace of the revolution, that's what all of the symbolism was saying, but it was also the birthplace of what was called the festival marketplace. The Faneuil Hall model, this festival marketplace model, was supposed to be more authentic, to use a word that you still hear in branding today. Rather than new tan boxes, the frame for this mall would be old brick buildings. And rather than chain stores, the businesses would be quirky and local. 
Rather than fast food, the cafes would sell fresh pastries and the delis fresh fish. James Rouse was not the first to propose adaptive reuse of historic, commercial, and industrial architecture for shopping, but he became the country's biggest developer and popularizer of the idea. The Thompson's version of the downtown mall included no department store, no national chains, no shoe stores, just small locally owned businesses. And Rouse compared it to the open air farmer's market on Alvera Street in Los Angeles, while Ben Thompson brought up Girardelli Square in San Francisco, which had been completed about 10 years earlier. Um, Girardelli Square was brick warehouses refitted as a complex of shops and offices. Um, and Thompson really believed that the novelty of this kind of marketplace would create its own drawing power. And beyond that, the city itself um, was a power um, and provided the anchor that the department stores would, would not. So despite a lot of kind of negative talk around the idea of a successful opening downtown, 100,000 people visited Faneuil Hall and Quincy Market on opening day and more came to it in its first year than visited Disneyland in 1977. Half of the visitors were from Boston, a quarter were from the suburbs, and a quarter were tourists, quickly doubling the per square foot results that Rouse expected. The opening of Faneuil Hall and Quincy Market was treated as a game changer for cities. Finally, someone had come up with a, um, a solution for what ailed downtown. Surely every city had a brick warehouse, many had more than one, that with added globe lights and exposed beams and cheese counters and cafe tables could become a hub of activities after offices closed. So Rouse and the Thompsons teamed up twice more, first to build Harbor Place on the Baltimore waterfront and then South Street Seaport in Manhattan. And as you see here, Rouse made the cover of Time Magazine in 1981 with the headline, Cities Are Fun. Um, 100 new downtown retail centers opened between 1970 and 1988, with the city as co-investor in three quarters of those projects. So festival marketplaces accounted for um, only about 30% of those, but they got the most press and required the most artistic hand both in the selection of buildings for adaptive reuse and then in the careful curation of the stores within. In Indiana, those trends, the festival marketplace, the downtown mall, the new Main Street, were reflected in a couple of different ways. Um, there was the commons, which I already described, anchored by a department store and cinema, but offering, also offering that indoor year-round amenities that you might find in a traditional town square. Second, there was Keystone at the Crossing, which won an Indiana Society of Architects Excellence Award in 1974. Keystone at the Crossing, um, which was built outside of Indianapolis, originally consisted of two freestanding parts, the Fashion Mall and the Bazaar, which were attached by a long glass corridor. That's what the crossing referred to. A silo with the mall's name as a super graphic marked the entrance, as if to suggest that the new mall with its big barn-like roofs was built from parts of an old farm. So they're kind of faking the idea of reusing commercial and industrial architecture here. When it opened, there were actually still working farms nearby, but now it just anchors a multi-mile shopping district and is surrounded by commercial and residential architecture. In this project, I'm primarily interested in the bazaar, which was designed by Rin Painter of Wright, Porteus, and Lowe. Um, it was wood-sided with the kind of diagonal lines typically associated with California, um, Northern Bay Area architecture. Um, and second, the 45 businesses inside were mostly local, and it was stocked with restaurants, antique stores, and artisan shops. Um, I've been unable to find good photos of this, so I actually want to show you a very short video clip from YouTube that I found online that kind of like does a mini tour of the bazaar because I just think it, uh, it really seems like a place I would want to go today. So hopefully I can make this work. I'm supposed to turn down the volume so I don't hurt your ears. The Bazaar, 
at Keystone at the Crossing is a, in a unique assemblage of some 45 merchants who really um, have a great opportunity in that they're meeting the public in a different frame than is found in the typical shopping center. And that the average shopper who comes to Keystone at the Crossing is coming with the idea of seeing a unique shopping center and uh, they're expecting to see something different, and they do see something different. Uh, we have these 45 merchants, and they range from artisans at work to a uh, number of restaurant operations, and uh, uh, all of which have been uh, coming along quite successfully. And uh, in fact, in some instances, uh, we have um, tenants who have their number one national operation in this project, uh, in volume and sales figures. We I'll stop it there. Just wanted to give you a little taste of what it looked like inside. Um, I also, um, the AIA citation um, for this project, uh, I thought made some important points about kind of the aesthetics of this and how it made people feel differently than other types of malls. Uh, it reads, at a time when much of modern architecture is under criticism as too disciplined and too inhumane, it is pleasant to see a complex that is disciplined but still festive, large scale but til still totally related to human scale and the people who live and work there. Its complexity is calculated. Space, color, and warmth come from the thoughtful design and the choice of materials. So the bazaar and Ghirardelli Square in San Francisco turn out to share a consultant team, student and Carrie Rose. And the Roses um, really became another kind of ambassador you know, across the country, ambassadors across the country for this kind of small scale localized versioning of the mall. But meantime, in downtown Indianapolis, Simon Properties began to work with city leaders to bring an atrium-centered air-conditioned mall and entertainment complex to the commercial core, funded in part by tax increment bonds, federal loans, and invest eventually investments from local business leaders. They wanted a gallery of their own, if you will. Um, and the downtown mall was originally supposed to be designed by John Jurdy, the Los Angeles architect who had taken up Gruen's mall innovation mantle in the 1980s. Um, so you can see two of Jurdy's major projects here. He was really, I would say, the third mall innovator after Gruen and Rouse. Um, in the early 1980s, his firm changed the primary driver of the mall from shopping to entertainment making it much bigger, making it mixed use, and adding themed elements more like Epcot than Disneyland's main street. His first attempt to do this was at Horton Plaza in San Diego, an indoor out and outdoor mall that was built in that city's historic downtown and designed to resemble a Hollywood version of an Italian hill town with striped palazzo-like buildings like Siena and lots and lots of level changes. Although it was originally supposed to be enclosed, developer Albert Hahn saved money by removing the roof of the mall, which also saved Horton Plaza from becoming a kind of drive-in, drive-out complex. Reading descriptions of how the project now known as Circle Center Mall came about, I can understand why Indianapolis leaders would have been interested in Horton Plaza. As in San Diego, they wanted to insert something new into downtown to provide an, both an aesthetic and commercial shock to its system without completely wiping out the existing commercial architecture. The long delays and cost overruns for the Indianapolis project eventually led to Jurdy's departure, um, and Aaron Krantz and Extut were the architects for the mall, which opened in 1995. I, I can't help but be a little bit curious about what Jurdy might have produced for Indianapolis. Um, but Circle Center still like, shares a lot of DNA with the Jurdy projects. Um, it has the indoor air-conditioned square footage and amenities of a suburban mall, the curving glass roof of a galleria, and the veneer of historic preservation in the form of 17 preserved buildings and eight historic facades. 
So while Indianapolis city leaders didn't want to demolish existing commercial buildings only to replace them with the kind of blank masonry walls better suited to a mall parking lot, uh, the, the resulting mall still has a lot of blank walls and the skyways between the structures take pedestrians off the street and into the sealed multi-block multi environment of Circle Center. Today, Circle Center is, like many structures built in the 1990s, extremely dated. Um, and its success is premised on a shopping model that most consumers no longer uh, are interested in. I think it's easier in some ways to feel romantic or nostalgic for the commons or the bazaar, which were, were built in the 1970s, than it is for Circle Center. Um, but the most recent news reports, I was trying to read up on what was happening with Circle Center before I came here, um, suggest that it will be redeveloped as a mixed use center with multifamily housing, uh, additional street facing retail to kind of undo some of that blankness um, at the sidewalk level and entertainment uses. Um, a logistics company just announced they're moving their offices to the former Nordstrom space and a body care company just opened its first retail location at the mall, um, which is interesting to me because from all reports, makeup stores like Sephora and Ulta Beauty have been a powerhouse despite the so-called death of retail. So Circle Center, as I'm sure many of you have observed, is far from the only mall seeking new life. Um, I've read widely, wildly varied estimates about how many malls are going to live and how many are going to die over the next five years. But regardless, there are hundreds in both categories. Each of them an opportunity, I think, to right some of the wrongs of 20th century urbanism. During the pandemic, emptied out uh, department stores have been pressed into service as testing sites, vaccination halls, and food distribution hubs. The ease with which the stores were pressed into service underlines some of their continuing strengths. They have central locations in both cities and suburbs. They have generous indoor square footage, all climate controlled. And they've also been designed to be quite accessible, at least by car. Um, in terms of more ambitious mall redevelopment projects, I really like um, Austin Community College's Highland Campus um, as a mixed use solution. Um, on that campus, Barnes, Gramatsky, Kosarik Architects converted the concrete windowless uh, 200,000 square foot for me, former JCPenney building into a student center and tech hub, cutting a 170 foot long skylight into the roof and creating indoor pathways with glass fronted rooms in the former boutiques and a big open plan computer lab with 600 workstations. Apartment buildings have been built on the former parking lots and the Dillard's, uh, which was at the other end of the mall, recently reopened as a studio, auditorium, and offices for the local PBS station. A light rail station links the whole complex to Austin's downtown. And according to the college's chancellor, students' positive associations with the mall helps them to feel comfortable on campus. Um, the college even saved a giant fiberglass hot dog from the original food court, which has become a popular photo op. Um, so this is sort of a top-down version of adaptive reuse. The college partnered with developers and then eventually with the PBS station to redevelop the whole site over a period of about 10 years. But a lot of other adaptive reuse of malls have come from bottom-up changes. Local developers noting the increasing diversity of the suburbs and tweaking existing malls. Um, and many of these redevelopments center around food. June Williamson and Ellen Dunham Jones book, Retrofitting Suburbia, um, highlights one of these developers, Jose de Jesus Legaspi, um, who's a Los Angeles-based consultant and who now has an almost 20-year career retrofitting dying malls for um, Latin and Caribbean entrepreneurs and customers. His largest project is this one, La Grande Plaza in Fort Worth, um, on the site of the former Seminary South Shopping Center, which was built in 1962. Um, Dunham Jones and Williamson Wright of Legaspi projects that they typically incorporate a space refitted as a mercado filled with small booths and shops for Hispanic vendors selling goods and services. 
um, a signage and print shop, a tailor, party supplies, t-shirts, real estate and travel agents, such as one would find in a town or village market in Mexico or Guatemala. A friend of mine just recently went to a Legaspi mall outside Atlanta and said that there was a you know, mariachi band playing in the middle and she bought um, some trinkets for her cousin who was about to celebrate her quinceanera. And she, somebody who's traveled extensively in Latin America, and she was like, yeah, it felt exactly like the markets in Latin America. Um, so projects like Essex Market in Lower Manhattan, which opened in 2019, might look a little bit different in materials from places like La Grande Plaza, but it's based on the same idea um, as Legaspi was using there, and that, in fact, Rouse and the Thompsons brought to cities in the 1970s taking the local and historical and putting it into a more designed, more centralized, and easier to use context. In this case, it allowed longtime food vendors um, in an outdated market across the street um, to try out their concepts in this newly designed environment, um, which now sits at the base of three new residential towers uh, built above and around the market. It also gives tourists, um, drawn by the area's immigrant and manufacturing history, a one-stop place to sample foods they may not have access to in their towns. One of John Jurdy's insights, um, also part of Gruen's original mall pitch, was to keep families staying at the mall as long as possible. And in order to do so, you had to have something fun for the kids. He took it a step further than the carousel or a McDonald's play area, the Mall of America had an entire theme park, originally Camp Snoopy, in the middle, with restaurants arranged around the central atrium overlooking the roller coasters. As malls start to reposition themselves in the 21st century, entertainment remains a major driver. Um, movie theaters, VR experiences, trampoline parks, climbing walls, and even, in this example that I just recently read about, mountain biking in a former Sears store. Um, so this is where I hope it becomes clear that I didn't write my history of malls and I'm not continuing to talk about malls purely for nostalgic reasons. Um, I really want everyone to take on the knowledge about how malls are and were well designed, how they've already changed a lot with the times, and how they've acted as important community spaces. Armed with this knowledge, I hope that we should all be better positioned to consider what might be done with the dead mall in our town, city, or suburb. Um, and to all designers and planners in the audience, I want you to consider dead malls with the same creativity and excitement that those old warehouses once generated. There are definitely more stories to be written about malls, and the ones that I tell in my book are really just the start. So, thank you. I'm happy to take questions if people have them. Or were you going to do the yeah, drawing? I'm going okay. To do a drawing first. Okay. And then um, we could do the drawing after the Q&A. After the Q &A? Okay. All right. Let's see. If there are any questions? I have the mic here. You've you've written by a about a lot of things. Um, any any favorites, uh, subjects, or areas you want to uh, sort of uh, give us a hint about as, as far as your personal favorites are concerned? And, and maybe it's a follow-up question. I think it's important that we invite design critics to come to schools and, and uh, tell us, you know, a, a lot of things. Um, any advice to students uh, uh, from a design critic as well? Um. Let me think. Uh, so first of all, what's my f favorite topic? Well, I think my favorite topic is really, well, kind of more the subject of my last book, which is called The Design of Childhood, um, and it's design for children. But what I found in 
researching this book is that there's a lot about children by and for children in the mall. Um, I have a whole section in my book that I didn't really get into today about how teenagers have used and loved the mall and how it's so hard to find spaces designed for teenagers and the fact that teenagers adopted the mall has been a really important outlet for them over time. And that, again, like with the demise of the mall in many places, cities have to think about are they providing alternate spaces for teenagers because teenagers without spaces get into all kinds of trouble. Um, so I think, you know, I started writing about children like as a mother and a design critic, trying to like bring these two spheres of my life together. And now I feel like I'm kind of following my children as they get older. They're now 11 and 15. And so I can see a lot of the issues that I talk about in terms of public space and provision for children, like through their experiences and what they are and aren't getting in the city. Um, in terms of design criticism, uh, I think it's, it's just really important to understand that you can, you can make something, you can design something, but other people are going to see it differently and that's okay. Like the, there are a million and one ways to see any project and a million and one ways to kind of provide a narrative for that project. And I think architects and planners are often called upon to provide that narrative. And sometimes they get defensive when other people provide an alternate narrative. But we all need to listen to each other and to kind of find truths in the different ways that people look at things. I also think it's important to read architecture criticism, just to understand like the different modes and the different language that people use to talk about um, talk about design. Like I, I'm friends with a lot of other architecture critics and I realized a few years ago that it wasn't worth feeling competitive with them because even if we all went to the same place and wrote a review ostensibly about the same thing, each of those reviews was going to be so imprinted with our own perspective um, and our own personality that you know readers don't have to choose just one. In fact, like sometimes it's really fun to read like five reviews of the same building. So there's no need for competition because criticism is as personal an act as design is. Other questions? I see somebody in the back. I see somebody up here. Is there, I mean, you can just ask me. Um, Was there someone that was influential to you? Um, like, how did you find your path? Well, let's see. I, I have an undergraduate studio degree in architecture. And I do feel like it's important that at one point in time, I thought I was going to be a designer. And I kind of like got my hands into it. Because I do feel like I understand the design process in a way that somebody who's never you know, stayed up all night building a model um, might not understand. But um, I feel I was lucky to grow up or sort of like be interested in architecture at a time that coincided with a certain heyday in architecture criticism. When I was in college, Ada Louise Huxtable was the architecture critic for the New York Times, and she was a very big deal. Like she had a national reputation. And so I always had an idea that, that like that was what an architecture critic could be, <laughs> that like people would listen to her and she would be published in the New York Times all the time and like she could you know, change the flow of bad projects. So I think it wasn't so much what I was being taught in school, but a combination of the experiences that I had in school and the kind of public discourse around architecture that was going along then that made me think, oh, maybe I should switch from trying to make architecture to writing about architecture. And then eventually I went back and got a PhD um, in architecture history, focusing on post-war corporate design. And that comes back in all of my work. Like I just, I feel very familiar with the players and the styles of architecture in the post-war era. And obviously that comes into play and is useful when you're writing about shopping malls because like that's when it all started. Um, so you talked a little bit about zoning 
land ownership, and uh, I'm an urban planning student. So um, could you talk a little bit more about the barriers that, I guess, society faces in adaptive reuse or reusing malls, and how we can overcome those barriers or tips to overcome them? Sure. I don't know about tips because these are like <laughs> these are like the thorny issues of planning, really. Um, I mean, the major barrier is that part of the whole point of suburbs was single-use zoning. Like, the powers that be at that time thought that they wanted to have houses over here and shopping over here and roads over here and kind of like never the twain should meet. And I read a lot of, um, you know, shopping mall manuals from the 50s and 60s and they all talk about planting a high hedge behind your mall so the neighbors next door like aren't annoyed by your parking lot. And like in this day and age, I think a lot of us would much rather be able to walk from our house to the mall rather than having to get in our car and drive all the way around. But that's not the way that the zoning is set up. So, I mean, the first thing that a municipality that wants to redevelop its mall as a mixed use place to you know, add housing, add offices, et cetera, they're gonna have to pro likely change the zoning for the site. Um, but I don't think that's impossible. Uh, just one example, in New Jersey, the state legislator, legislature is considering basically a five-year like, zoning moratorium on both mall and office park sites. Basically saying like, for these five years post-pandemic and in order to help with recovery, like, you can propose any use for these sites. You don't have to stick to the underlying zoning. And I think that kind of legislation could really do a lot of good in other places too. Thank you. Other questions? So any, any other commentary about the Muncie Mall? <laughs> well, I mean, Again, I, you know, I tried to do a little reading before I came here, and I really, um, I love the idea that you had a studio in the mall. Like, I actually think, you know, I used the example in my talk of Austin Community College, um, you know, taking over the mall and turning the whole thing into the campus. But why not a more kind of subtle infiltration of education spaces into the mall? You know, malls are places, um, for teenagers, malls are places where young people hang out. Even at the Muncie Mall, like there are a lot of empty stores, but the stores that are there do tend to, I think, have a pretty youth-focused orientation. So the idea of having a kind of public-facing classroom where people might see what you're all doing at this school, like have their ideas solicited, actually just seems like a great idea. And that's you know kind of a smaller version of mixed-use zoning in a way, like just mixing up the uses within the mall. Um, I have to say, I actually expected the Muncie Mall to be more depressing. Like there were like a good number of people there. Um, the Christmas decorations are out. The Muzak was on. Um, it felt like there were still people using it, even if not enough to support its full complement of stores. Any last question? All right. Let's give our thanks to Alexandra. Thank you.